Good morning, everyone. We are in the middle of a series that's looking at Harbor Church values. So some of the things we're looking at are things that we already do well. So you saw Susie lead us in prayer, and that's one of our central values. But we're also talking about some things that we would like to do, to do more of. And we looked at that with uh, Jeremy, no, not Jeremy, Jana and John talking about being sent into avoidable and unavoidable places in our lives. And this sermon this morning is a continuation of that. We're looking at the ways in which we're sent and the message that we are sent with out into the world. But before we do that, uh, please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your church and for your life and your death and your resurrection and your love. And we ask that this morning you make us sponges for your truth and that you make us hunger and thirst for your love and for your message. Amen. So in the basement of my parents' house, we have this old upright piano. And slowly over the years, it slipped out of tune. And we had a guy come to tune it. And after he left, I sat down at the piano to play some scales and check his handiwork. And the first scale sounded all right. It went And it worked pretty well, you know, satisfying, complete scale in tune. And then I played the next scale. And the piano tuner had tuned two notes the same. So when you played the scale, it left you with this incomplete feeling, this desire for that final last note to make it feel complete and to make it feel resolved. And that's something we have to consider each week when we're planning for worship. We can end songs triumphantly in ways that kind of make you feel prepared for battle. Or we can end it in ways that are comforting and resolved. Or we can also choose to end the songs in a way that are incomplete, that beg to be finished, or that leave you longing for the rest of the song, for that one final note to finally put you at rest. And the passage we're looking at this morning is at the end of Matthew, and it's sending you out into the world with this declaration that happens to have all three. It has a triumphant ending, it has a comforting ending, but it also scratches at you and leaves you wanting for more. And so let's turn to Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. And this is from the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we start looking at the top of this passage, we notice the line talking about the 11 disciples went to Galilee. And this is an important thing to notice, because when we look at the number 11, we remember all of the things that these people have gone through. They followed Jesus for years, and in the past few weeks, maybe months, they saw their Lord and leader be betrayed by one of their own, making them go down from 12 to 11. They saw Jesus die. They thought he was dead, and then he came back to life. And now they're in this beautiful state, but they still are carrying a lot of baggage with them. They've seen a lot, and they have a lot to recover from. And so then you see the phrase that follows, they worshiped and some doubted. And this could feel us, fill us with sadness, but actually I think there's some hope buried in this phrase because here they are with all this baggage and doubt, but the message that follows is still for them. And likewise, we come into the church and we come into faith with baggage and doubt and with past experiences that could make us ill-equipped to go out into the world. But instead, it's those very doubts and struggles, and it's in that state in which we are sent. And so you look at these 11 disciples and you have Thomas, who is famous for his moment of doubt. And you have Peter, the rock on which the church is built who walked on water and then in a moment of doubt slipped beneath the surface. And the message of, of being sent out into the world is for him. 
And the Bible is full of these people who are doubters and excuse makers and have infinite excuses of why they don't have to go, and yet they are sent. So you have Moses who was sent to Egypt and said, but Lord, I'm not a good public speaker. And God said something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, tough. <laughs> and then uh, you have prophets that you guys looked at before I came here, the, uh, the minor prophets, who all came with infinite excuses of why they were ill-equipped to go, or why they weren't ready, or why they had doubts that got in the way of them going out into the world, yet they were sent. And so in the brokenness of these 11 disciples who worshipped and yet doubted, we have hope for ourselves and hope for the message that we are to bring. Because if you look at the command they're given, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's really big. That's a really scary mission, a scary command. And it fills us with fear and we start spilling out excuses. I'm, I'm not a good public speaker or I don't have all of my theology right or settled or I don't have that salesperson gene that allows me to go and give a message that other people are going to grasp onto and agree with and follow. You know, I just, I'm ill-equipped or I have doubts sometimes. I doubt about this whole Jesus thing. I don't have it all together. Yet, this message is for us. Because if you look, it doesn't say, go and make converts. It doesn't say, go give moving sales speeches to make people buy into this. It also doesn't say, go and make elders, or pastors, or theology professors. It says, go and make disciples and, teaching, and teach. And this is a much gentler command. It's something that we're better able to do Especially if you notice that teaching in the biblical sense is not like we're used to seeing it. We think of education as something that happens in a school building until the bell rings. And when the bell rings, you are no longer a student and you have stopped learning. Or when you receive a diploma, you are no longer a student. But teaching in the biblical sense, in the sense of a disciple, is a lifelong process. So when you're sent out into the world, of course you're not going to have all of the answers because you're still a student yourself. You're still a disciple. So yeah, you're going to go out into the world without your theology all in place. Of course. And you're going to go out into the world of people who might not be that receptive to the message you have to give at this moment. But it's okay because you have a lifetime of opportunities to share the gospel. It's sort of like what John said when he was talking about how we at Harbor are wounded healers. We come into the church with our doubts and our brokenness, and that's a beautiful thing, because in these broken states, we're able to open ourselves up to others and heal them while we're still healing ourselves. And in the same way, while we were still broken, Christ loved us. And while we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while we, while we were still doubters, Christ sent us, and we're sent to be and to make disciples. And disciples are those that model themselves after the life of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. And so if we are in fact using Jesus as model, this means two things. First, we can look at the way Jesus lived with people and alongside people. <coughs> Jesus taught by example. He lived with the poor and he lived in their homes and he fed the hungry, he healed the sick. So he shared the message of the truth of God by living with people and dwelling with them and walking alongside them and listening patiently. And in the same way, we are called to reflect Jesus in our actions. And this is something that we agree to readily. You know, we say, yeah, I feel like I'm called to to love the poor and the sick and care for them. We may not do it, but we agree that it's something that we're called to do. But we can't just stop there because Jesus didn't just live with people and love them. Jesus also taught them with words. Jesus shared the truth of scripture to them and explained to them who God is with words. And in the same way, we're called not only to live alongside people, but also to speak to them and to share the truth of the gospel. 
But as I said, we're not all theology professors, so we don't have to share it, perhaps with the same authority that Jesus did, because we don't have that. We don't have the expertise that he did. So instead, we can share it as we are broken, in our broken selves, and representative of who we are. I, for one, am a lover of stories, and so I prefer to communicate the news of Jesus Christ through how God has worked through me in my life. One way that I can say that, a story that I can tell, is about dealing with depression. I was depressed for many years, and I had mornings where I couldn't get out of bed because I felt worthless, and I felt broken, and in desperate need of something I didn't know what. And in that broken state, I had these beautiful promises. The promises of a God who loves me and knows that, yeah, I'm broken and I needed saving. And so died for me and was raised from the dead and is now the savior of my soul. And I can tell other people, not a complete structured gospel message given to me from somebody else, but my story, the story of how I cannot live without God in my life and how this is a beautiful thing that is open to you as well. Stories also allow us to realize that those structured, planned gospel messages aren't always going to fit into the ragged edges of our lives. So, for example, uh, last summer I was living and working in Sequoia National Park, and every Sunday I would lead worship services in the campground amphitheaters. But the most important part of my job was working in the park and living in the employee dorms with all of the other seasonal employees and being a Christian presence in their lives, something that many of them had never been exposed to. And I had this one friend who was a staunch atheist and he was very antagonistic and he would frequently get into arguments with me over like elements of Christianity and talk about how he didn't like Christians. And this one day, I walked into the employee break room, and he was sitting on the couch watching TV, and he was very drunk. And he looks at me and he goes, Libby, you're not one of those seven-day creationists, are you? <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can either walk away and ignore him and ignore these barbs, but instead I decided to sit down with him. And I sat with him for over two hours and discussed how knowing God as the creator of the world makes the natural world more beautiful to me, makes things like science and understanding where we're going, where we're coming from, and how to care for this world only more important. And so I didn't give him a strict message of you know, sin and salvation, but I did explain to him how being a Christian can be something rational and beautiful, and how you don't have to give up an intellectual life to follow Christ. Instead, you dive into it deeper. And then that's how, that's how God works in my life and can work in yours too. And at that moment, my friend didn't become a Christian. He's still an atheist. But as I said earlier, teaching and being a disciple is a lifelong process. And he's taken a step because when I left that summer, he said to me, Libby, you are the first Christian that I didn't hate. <laughs> Which is kind of bleak yeah. and kind of beautiful. Um, so he's taken a step in the right direction. But that also reveals to me another truth. That we go out into the world broken and with doubts and faults, but we're going out into a broken world. And we don't know the conditions of those who, are we, who we are sharing the gospel to. Because like we are not perfect, they are not perfect. If you look at the parable of the sower, the farmer didn't just sow the seed onto the fertile soil. The farmer also threw the seeds onto the rocky soil and onto the weedy soil. And we are called to do the very same thing. We might look at that farmer and say, why did he throw the seeds onto the rocky soil? He knew nothing would grow there. And that's where the metaphor of farming kind of falls short. Because we don't waste the gospel by throwing it to a place where it won't grow. And we don't run out of the truth of God and who God is in our lives. We're not going to run out 
by giving it to somebody who doesn't receive it. And finally, it's not our call to make because we are sharing God's story. And where God makes it grow, it will grow. And it doesn't matter if we throw it to rocky soil or drunk soil or antagonistic <laughs> soil. If God wants it to grow, it will grow. And this also shows that we don't sow, we don't share the gospel because we're ready and willing, because we have gifts of speaking, or because we have firm theology, or because the soil is tilled in its planting season. We sow the seeds because Christ has the authority to tell us to do so. If you look at the scripture, it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And this is that triumphant ending I was talking about. If you look at the scripture, it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all of the earth, teaching them all that I have taught you and baptizing in all of the parts of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and surely I will be with you always. It sounds like a king on horseback leading a battle, leading an army to battle. You know, it sounds something like, let's see here, uh, there may come a day when the courage of men fail, but that is not this day, which is a Lord of the Rings reference to kind of tell you a bit about who I am. So Christ is the king, sitting on horseback, calling us to go out into the world. And Christ, as king, has the authority to command us to do so. And we should do so for no other reason than the authority. But authority is kind of a tricky thing. We have very muddled views of authority. We have presidents who we choose and choose theoretically to do what we want them to do. And if they don't do what we want them to do, we impeach them. And you have kings and queens in England, but they're more like figureheads. And you also have bosses and teachers and parents who we don't really listen to. And then on the flip side, you have dictators who don't want the best for their people and who aren't fair and gracious and loving leaders. And this has led us to an uncomfortable place when we look at authority. When somebody tells us to do something, we don't want to do it. And I have a weird example of that. I'm a manager of a cafe on my college campus. And sometimes I have employees come up to me and say, hey Libby, uh, I'm done with my job, what would you like me to do? And this one day I told a kid, well, we have some extra time, so how about you go to the back, take stuff out of the shelves of the fridge, wipe down the, sh the shelves, and put the stuff back. And he looks me in the eye and he goes, no, I don't want to do that. I don't like to do that. And it blew my mind. Like, he came to me asking for a job, and when I gave him a job, he refused to do it. <laughs> but we do that all the time to God. We go in prayer to God and say, Lord, give me guidance. And God says what he wants us to do. And then we say, oh, no thanks. I don't like that one. I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to do my own thing. Or we flip through the Bible and we find something else that suits us a little better. That's better suited for our gifts and for our talents. Yeah, that's what we're going to do instead. But Jesus isn't a president. Jesus isn't a figurehead. Jesus isn't a dictator. Jesus is a good leader with good commands. He lived with the poor and he loved his enemies, and we're called to do the same, using him as a model. Because authority means power. Jesus in Christ has power over all of the earth, heaven and earth, over the good and the bad soil, over doubters and non-doubters. But authority doesn't just mean power. Authority also means the right. <coughs> Jesus, as our Savior and Lord, has the right to send us out into the world with this command. And we ought to do it just because he told us to. But he didn't send us alone. I talked about the comforting way of resolving earlier, and that's also there too. We're not sent alone because we have the Holy Spirit there to equip us. We're sharing God's message with God's help. If you look at Luke 24, there's another, uh, another rendition of the Great Commission, and it has different words, but it's in Luke 24, 46. This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And we have received that power of the Holy Spirit, 
that is sending us out into the world. And this is a beautiful thing because we have the power and the authority and the comfort to go out into the world. And those are perfectly good reasons to go. But I think there's one more reason why we should go. Not just because we're told, but also because we want to. Because of the hope that this message plants in us, it's that longing, incomplete ending that I was talking about. We're filled with the love of God through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that should send us out into the world. Because this message is so beautiful and expansive and profound. And it equips us to get out of bed in the morning. And it equips us to love others and share the message of God. And these promises ought to radiate out of us. Christ's authority ought to be all we need to go out into the world. But also, we should share the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because we've received such a beautiful gift. And how could we keep it to ourselves? Please pray with me. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. We thank you for your message and for your love and for all you've done in our lives. And we ask that you equip us to share your message to the ends of the world. And thank you for your promise that surely you will be with us always. Amen.